this is an example of finding confidence intervals for means, but we are going to focus on large samples. Uh, so this is a specific example for finding confidence intervals, but you got to make sure that you have a large sample. So how do we know if something is a large sample? Well, if n, which is our sample size, if our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, that is considered a large sample sample. So if you have a sample size, if you're watching this video and you have a, uh, you're trying to get some help and you have a sample size that's less than 30, you probably want to try to find one of my other videos um, to see um, uh, to see how to work through a confidence interval for means for small samples. This is for large samples. Um, now the other thing that we could uh, use this particular example for is if your population standard deviation is known. So if I had a small sample, but I knew what the population standard deviation was, if I knew this, then I could go ahead and, and follow this as an example to, to get some help as well. But if you don't know your population standard deviation and your sample size is not greater than or equal to 30, you want to try to find a different video. <clears throat> so anyways, let's jump into uh, what a confidence interval looks like. Well, down here is the formula for creating a confidence interval for means if we have a large sample. Okay, so let's dig into this a little bit. First of all, uh, every confidence interval is made up by some kind of estimate plus or minus the margin of error. So we have an estimate and then a margin of error. In this case, my estimate, whoops, my estimate is x bar, my sample mean. The sample mean is going to be my estimate. And then I'm going to add and subtract to that my margin of error to create my interval. And then for when I create confidence intervals for means, this right here is the, is the margin of error. Now again, keep in mind, we're talking about large samples this margin of error will change, or at least the way you find the margin of error will change if I have a small sample or if I'm dealing with proportions. So again, this is a confidence interval for means when I have a large sample. You have to remember that because this formula does not apply to all confidence intervals. All right, <clears throat> let's look at our example. A random sample of 32 gas grills has a mean price of $630.90 and a standard deviation of $56.70. Find the 90% confidence interval for the population mean, the population mean cost of gas grills. All right. <clears throat> well, there's a number of different things that I know. Let's just let's just take a look at what I know. Well, first of all, I need to find the sample mean. Well, that is right here, $630.90. I also need to know the standard deviation. Well, that's right here, $56.70. Another thing that I need to know for my formula is the sample size. And the sample size is right here, 32. Now, the last thing I need is this Z. And I don't know what that is yet. But I can get this from the confidence level. See the little subscript C right here. This is this stands for the confidence level. And in this case, my confidence level is 90%. Okay? Well, how do I know what the Z score is for a 90% confidence level? Well, let me show you a little table here. All right here, I've got a table. And some of the most common confidence levels or level of confidence is, I don't even know if that's a word, are 90%, 95%, and 99%. Most of the time, you're going to see one of these confidence levels when you're dealing with confidence intervals. There are others, but these are the three most common. And over here on this side of the table, I have the Z-score which goes with each confidence level. So I wanted, in this problem, I have a confidence level of 90%, and that means I am going to use a Z-score, come right across here, of 1.645. If my confidence level was one of these other two, I would use this as my Z-score, okay? 
So let's start to plug things in to my formula now. Create some space for myself. And I'll actually bring this formula down. Let me copy it. And then pull it down here so we can see it a little bit easier. And let's plug in what we know. So I start with my estimate, my point estimate, which is my sample mean, $630.90, plus or minus my critical value or my z-score. And remember, we look looking at our table here, it's 1.645. Oops, scroll back down again. So 1.645. And I'm going to multiply that times the, the um, standard deviation which is 5670, all over the square root of my sample size, which is 32. Now I would jump to my calculator, and I would do all of the math. So 630, uh, I could type it all in. Let me go ahead and bring my calculator up, and I'll just show you how you would type this in. If you wanted to type it all in at the same time, you got to be kind of careful. So I would go 630.9. I'm going to do the minus. Your calculator, you know, most likely won't do the plus and the minus at the same same time. Maybe some of the more fancy calculators do. Mine, I don't think, does. So I'm going to go $630.90 minus 1.645. And then in parentheses for multiplication, let's put my uh, standard error, which is 56.7 divided by the square root of my sample size. And when I hit enter, I get my value. Now, the nice thing about the calculator is, let me pull it over here so it's a little bit larger. The nice thing about the calculator is if I just hit second and enter, it'll pull up my last entry. And the only thing I have to change is this from a minus, I just have to change it to a plus. And there I've got the minus and the plus. When I hit enter, it gives me the other value for my interval. It gives me the upper limit of my interval. So I'm going to pull this into my document. And you can see that the calculator has done the math for me. You know, if you're watching this, then you then you probably know how to do the algebra to get these numbers. So uh, most of the time, your teacher is going to be okay if you just plug things or, t or type things into a calculator. You should probably show your work just in case you want to try to get extra, you know, partial credit. But this is how you would do it. Now, I should not stop there. Whenever we create a confidence interval, we also need to write it in a complete sentence. And the, the confidence interval should always have three parts to it. The three parts that it should also ha all, always have are, uh, one, the interval itself. Two, it should also have the confidence level. And three, it should always include the context of the problem that you're looking at. So let me go ahead and type my answer. Let's go with this. I am 90% confident, there's my confidence level, that the mean price of a gas grill, there's my context, is between... Uh, let's look at our numbers over here. $614.41 and $647.39. And there we go. That's it. So I hope that this example helps you, but keep in mind, this is an example of how to find a confidence interval for means, which is a large sample. Okay, if you have a small sample, then your formula is going to be a little bit different. Pretty much everything else will be the same, but your formula will be slightly different. I hope this helps, and keep watching my videos. Please.